Welcome to The Conversation. I'm Carrie Ann, and I will be your host in this first segment of the show. Joining me, of course, is Jared, our resident astronomer, as well as Mike, our rocket specialist. We, of course, have Dutta behind us, who will be the actual producer of the show. Now, today in news, we have... One telescope gets the go-ahead, and another telescope gets a delay. And a commercial space station module gets an extension. And then in our second segment, we will be discussing the newly reformed National Space Council here in the United States. And then we will round out the show with questions and comments from, uh, from last week's episode. This, of course, is tomorrow, Orbit 10.37. Good morning. I want to make sure I give a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. These are the people who are the Escape Velocity variety. They get their show in all three segments. They, of course, get early access to After Dark as soon as it's available. Uh, they get a whole lot of things, actually, a view of the show rundown that we have going on, worldwide free swag in our Tomorrow store, so many other things. If you are interested in any of these and so much more, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. <sighs> Sorry, that was a little rough. I apologize. I was like, no, I don't need another run through. And just kidding, I totally did. Uh, in any case, <laughs> we very sadly do not have any launches. Not for lack of trying, though. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's really great, though, mm -hmm. is that everything that was supposed to be this week, or it feels like it, is moved to next week. And so, Mike, you definitely have your work cut out for you. <laughs> Cut out for you. Yeah, then. we had both a both a SpaceX launch and an Atlas V launch from United Launch Alliance that uh, was supposed to happen this week, but not quite. But hopefully, both of those will be next week as well. So totally, uh, which will be great because that Mike is going to sound like the Micro Machine Man for any of you old enough to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> oh, I hate you. Uh, no. <laughs> Super fast rocket action. I know. I'm just showing my age. It's fine. Uh, so, so we're, so we're just going to jump so. right into news then. So, uh, Jared. Tell me a little bit about this. I, I was calling this the Very Large Telescope, which is a misnomer because it is happens to be quite a sizable telescope. It is. But there is a telescope called the Very Large Telescope? Yes. And that's not this one. No, that one's run by the European Southern Observatory down in the Chilean Atacama Desert. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But that's not the one that we're going to be talking about today. What we're, are we talking about today? We're going to be talking about this telescope today, which is a long overdue astronomical project that has finally been given the go-ahead after an extremely tumultuous delay. And of course, this is the 30 meter telescope. This is going to be the largest telescope in the Northern Hemisphere, and it will be three times larger than the current largest telescopes that we have here on Earth. And as its name implies, guess what the diameter is gonna be? That's right, 30 meters. So construction actually started on the 30 meter telescope in October of 2014, three years ago, but demonstrations and protests a few months after that halted the construction. Now protesters against the 30 meter telescope have cited both environmental impacts on Mauna Kea in Hawaii and cultural impacts as well. Indigenous Hawaiians regard the mountain peaks in the chain of Hawaiian islands as sacred places to themselves. Now in December 2015, there was a blow to the 30 meter telescope project, which the Hawaiian Supreme Court pulled the construction permit saying that Hawaii's Board of Land and Natural Resources didn't properly vet petitions filed by protest groups. And one year later in December of 2016, Hawaii's Third Circuit Court ruled that the sublease between the 30 meter telescope project and the University of Hawaii was invalid because there was no hearing held to address petitioners issues. Now, Although the Board of Land and Natural Resources has formally approved the 30 meter telescope to move forward with its construction, protest groups have already publicly announced that they're gonna be filing appeals against it. Now, if building the 30 meter telescope becomes impossible on Mauna Kea, there are several backup sites in consideration, including the Canary Islands, and the 30 meter telescope is expected to be up and operational by the 2020s. Now, this is one of several large, very large telescopes that are being built right now, the largest of which is being built by the European Southern Observatory 
Observatory in the Chilean Andes. And that one will be a little bit bigger, 37 meters in diameter. Now, personally, I have very mixed feelings about the 30 meter telescope getting approval. I'm very happy that the project is now able to move forward formally um, and begin that progress work again. But I'm also very unhappy about this as well because the scientists and the project managers, they actually genuinely did a pretty bad job of ad addressing the concerns of the indigenous Hawaiian people. In fact, we handled it so poorly, I don't think that we're actually ever going to get approved to put another telescope up on Mauna Kea ever again. Hmm. So it's it was just, it was terrible handling of this whole situation yeah. by the scientists and the project managers. and. Overall, it's, it's really unfortunate that this ended up happening, um, especially since the considerations were sort of overlooked at that time. And, this, and like I said, this is probably going to be the last telescope ever built on Mauna Kea. We're going to probably end up building them somewhere else. So. I was just going to say, so stupid question, why would we need another telescope built here? Uh, well, Mauna Kea is a fantastic location because it is out in the middle of the ocean. Um, so first of all, there's very minimal uh, light pollution, light pollution out in that area. Um, in addition to that, the weather on Mauna Kea is excellent throughout the year. Okay. Um, the, and Mauna Kea is nearly 14,000 feet above sea level okay. as well. So it's above quite a lot of atmosphere and that allows even better seeing conditions to occur. So sure. location, location, location sure so pretty much <laughs> all right all right mm -hmm. uh and for those of you wondering uh for those of us who use imperial units oh yes uh, it's just under 100 feet uh yeah. 98.4252 i had to actually uh look that one up mm -hmm. just uh, <laughs> in case anyone's wondering <laughs> i know nobody here is but uh i was so there's that um okay so <laughs> mr mike uh so beam the uh bigelow aerospace, what is it, Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, yeah, it, mm, known as BEAM. Right. Uh, so uh, you're talking about having uh, BEAM do a little bit more on the International Space Station. Uh, I mean, I don't I don't want to eat too much into your story, but like, we, were we supposed to be taking this away and now we're keeping it, or we're, it wasn't supposed to be doing what it's mm -hmm. doing and now we're doing more with it? Well, the original purpose of BEAM was to be a two-year study to demonstrate whether or not expandable structures that aren't rigid structures would be able to handle, you know, radiation of space, uh, uh, being in the in vacuum, uh, being able to handle space debris, sure. you know, all those sort of factors. And so with the data that NASA and Bigelow Aerospace have been collecting with this test module, uh, they have been in talks to figure out whether or not to continue to use the, the module. And it looks like that NASA NASA is expressing a lot of interest in keeping this, the module because after the two-year mission, they were supposed to jettison the module. So. Hmm. Um, with this, uh, there. Let's go ahead and check out the inflation of this. It's a, yeah. it's a pretty small module, and it's docked to the Tranquility module, mm -hmm. which uh, is is kind of to the. It's it's very close to where the the Russian segment is connected to the the, the Unity module, mm -hmm. and there's a couple of free ports on that that I actually want to talk about a little bit later as well. But it's a pretty small module, but you can fit all six crew members inside of it once it, it's it's fully expanded, and. With this, they have, have, have issued, NASA has, has issued the synopsis of, of their intended contract on how they want to use this module. And what they want to do is pretty much use it for storage space, but also give Bigelow Aerospace opportunities to use it in a commercial way, like having the hosted experiments or you know any, any number of uses that people might want to use for that. Bigelow has kind of used uh, a few of the more non-traditional methods, like uh, putting people's pictures and, and uh, personal memorabilia on their first generation. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 space station modules. Mm, so mm. who knows what sort of opportunities they would try to, to, to utilize this for. But the contract for this calls for uh, at least another three years uh, using the beam module at the International Space Station. Mm. And uh, with that, there could be even more extensions after that. There's an option in this kind of this study. It's not formally announced yet, but they've just NASA and Bigelow Aerospace have kind of formally announced their interest in this. And starting this this kind of extended three-year mission as a storage space, starting pretty much as soon as this gets finalized mm -hmm. during this whole two-year mission. The data has been coming back so good. NASA's been so impressed by the data of how much this expandable module can withstand 
the radiation of space, space debris, and be able to, to keep its, its structure and, and pressure and just everything about it is working much better than anyone expected, I think. Hmm. And uh, so they're going to be uh, utilizing this as much as possible. It launched last year in 2016, and crew members have entered it 13 times to collect some of the data that's just automatically taken by the sensors inside. So I'm really happy about this. I'm impressed with this, and I really hope that Bigelow Aerospace is able to move on with their other concepts of expandable space station modules. And part of that is uh, has to do with the Next Step program, and we might see an expandable module at whatever might become of the Deep Space Gateway if that gets formally approved. <laughs> I love when you have a topic that you like, uh, you just keep harping on it. Uh, it's it's fantastic. Uh, I, I, I don't well, it's mean funny that. to see all the connections. Though, no, like I don't mean to harp on it. Yeah. I know, I, I'm not, I'm really not trying to be insulting. I just, I love that you're like, you're so passionate about it. You just keep bringing it up. Um, but you, and the other funny thing that I wanted to mention was you said, like nobody expected it to go this well. Uh, I feel like uh, Bob Bigelow probably did. Like, I feel like, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he probably, he had confidence in it all along. Yeah, but, right? yeah. He was like, well, when the aliens told me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so in more telescope news, which who thought there would be more telescope news? Oh, but mm. there is. Double dose of telescopes? <laughs> what? <laughs> so. Who would have thought, Jared, uh, what's going on with uh, James Webb? <sighs> Boy, here we go. It's news that you absolutely hate to hear, uh -huh. uh, but you also understand that it's a necessary thing. Sure. And you also know that somebody's probably won a bet somewhere over there, yeah, this. Yeah, there's definitely a dollar bet over this somewhere. As well. So, uh, guess what? The James Webb Space Telescope has been delayed to, to launch till 2019. <gasps> Darn, Connor! Sucks. We were so close! Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's being delayed again. Now, it was originally worried that J-Dub's uh, ride to space would be the reason for the delay mm -hmm. um, because NASA is getting a ride on an Ariane Space, Ariane 5, as a deal to allow several European Space Agency instruments on J-Dub. And this is, you know, this is pretty standard. You know, we kind of barter instruments for rides and other things like that. So, th that, I mean... This isn't out of the ordinary. So is that to say that we didn't have a ride for the James Webb Space Telescope, but somebody else said, hey, we would like to put some things on the James Webb Telescope. We said, that's cool, as long as you give us a ride. Yeah, basically, it's not that we didn't have a ride for James Webb. It's okay. just that we would have had to have paid for a ride for James Webb. So we always would have to pay for a ride until somebody suggested that... And, right? It's is, just is that... one way that you can get your ride covered is to basically say, so, hey, Europe, give us a rocket. We'll put some instruments on our telescope to make it happen. I need a ride so. to the airport, but all mm -hmm. I have are cheesy poofs. Yeah, kind of like that. It's like I'm, I'll give you a ride to LAX. Right. Or if you give me a ride to LAX, we'll stop at the in and out right. by LAX, okay. and I'll get you lunch. Just double checking. You know, kind of, right. it's, it's bartering. Yeah, um, oh, that's great. So, yeah. So... <laughs> This is, so, the real worry The whole thing was, with Ariane 5, though, is it's supposed to be retiring soon. That's the whole worry, right? Yeah, well, that's oh, part of the worry. Sure. One, the primary worry with launching on the Ariane 5 was that there's another European Space Agency mission called Bepi Colombo, mm -hmm. which will be heading off to study Mercury. And it need, Bepi Colombo needed to launch right in the middle of the planned launch window for the James Webb Space Telescope. And that's simply because of Bepi Colombo's trajectory to get to Mercury. It requires a significant number of flybys of Venus in order to slow it down to get to Mercury. So it's gotta launch at just the right time in order to do that. But NASA has announced that integration of instruments is taking longer than they expected. So the formal delay has been selected to assist with that. So now the European Space Agency and NASA can both have some breathing room for their respective missions. And I found this graphic, which I think is so oh, wow. awesome. This is how the James Webb <laughs> Space Telescope is going to be folded up to fit inside of an Ariane 5. Now, there, this is pretty much the primary reason why the Ariane 5 was chosen. It's because that payload fairing is actually large enough to fit a J the James Webb Space Telescope. Hmm. So most other rockets do not have a payload fairing that's actually capable of holding a folded up version of a eight meter space telescope. So goodness gracious, great googly moogly. The telescope that ate the budget is still delayed, but it's all right, we'll 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 contend with that, so. All right. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I, <laughs> yeah, go it ahead. makes me wonder which one is gonna cost more before uh, they launch, the Space Launch System or the James Webb Space Telescope? Oh, it's definitely oh. the Space Launch System. James Webb is, is approaching uh, double digit billion dollars just now, but 
but SLS is definitely a lot more expensive in terms of uh, uh, money spent uh, on it by this point. So, oh. yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, uh, you guys in the chat room can uh, correct us, and maybe you'll find out how much uh, each yeah, one's Yeah, someone in the so comments. Not including sure, Orion. So. Not including Orion. Yes. Yes. Sure, sure. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's, that's really yeah. funny. Uh, but, I mean, it's one of those things. It's, it's, going to, uh, it's going to a Lagrangian point, so it's a million miles, 1.6 million kilometers away from Earth. Mm -hmm. So it has to work. It's not like Hubble, where Hubble is designed to be serviceable where if something goes wrong with Hubble, you can actually send a team up um, and do that. Yeah, I know you have to rip some things out every once in a while, but it, you could still do that. Um, everything with and James how, Webb. How are we sending a team there? With a shuttle? Yeah, well, is it, oh, is it, we don't have that Earth anymore. Earth-Moon Lagrange point, right? Okay. Oh, it. Which one? Is it in an Earth-Moon Lagrange point yeah, or Earth-Sun Lagrange it's point? It's going to L2, so it's going behind uh, the Earth. So the Earth and the Sun. Yeah, so space gateway, cool. we could service it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, this yeah. Is, so, this is why you guys uh, are my favorite. We so it has to work. <laughs> sure. It's it, you get one shot at deploying yeah. this thing and getting it set. So it, it's it's one of those things where it's it, where it's frustrating that it keeps getting delayed. But sure. you know, if you put something in that's not going to work. It's not like we're going to be able to get up there real quick and actually fix it, because uh, we can't. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to go ahead and, and move along in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to take a calendar break. This is the first of two, because like I mentioned earlier, with no launches this last week, uh, there's quite a few coming up. So uh, if you didn't see your favorite launch coming up in the next week in this calendar, there will be another calendar break. Don't worry, you will find it there. And uh, also a really quick shout out to Jared because it is his birthday. Oh, yeah, it is that. So. I know. Another orbit. So <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> Happy orbital anniversary, Jared. All right, so uh, stay with us. And when we come back, we will be discussing the National Space Council, all of the ins, all of the outs, and... Uh, I'm sure you two are, are excited about oh, this yes. one. Oh, yes. There will be many Their things to meeting. speak about. Uh -huh. so. All right. <laughs> Stay with us. <laughs> we'll be right back. Look into her face, determination in her eyes. She won't give up a quick or for what little fashion lies. Fill the thoughts of expectation. This girl's a fascination. And welcome back to Tomorrow. And before we get into our main topic this week, a shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've contributed $10 or more. There are Escape Velocity patrons that get a bunch of really great rewards. We also have our Orbital patrons. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to this show. Also get some great rewards. To find out what those are, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. We are a crowdfunded show. Every single dollar helps, so thank you to everyone who has their name up on the slate uh, this week. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you mentioned in the news, um, I, I don't know how we're going to deal with launches next week. Mike, how many launches did you say we're estimating? Like, it could be as many as, is it nine? I think it could be as many as nine, yeah, if all of them go off. I mean, there's a high likelihood that a few of them won't go off. And, you know, some of these are Chinese launches, too. And that's kind of, you know, I'm never fully confident in estimations for Chinese launches until it actually happens. So we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Sorry, China doesn't normally announce them until they've actually gone anyway. Um, I, I think, <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it's a joke. I think uh, possibly if, if they all go or if there's enough of them, maybe Mike will just not have news. And yeah. he, honestly, and yeah. he, would, he would just do like some launches, maybe categorize them either by day or by country or what have you, uh, and just do you know some launches, <laughs> and then Jared does, and then we may have to. I mean, three in one day. There's yeah. supposed to be yeah. three. Yeah. Or that was that last. Crazy. I think that was that last calendar where they all said like, if you looked yeah. at the last one, it was like October nine, October nine, October nine, and there are so many launches. This next commercial break. Also a calendar, and the funny thing is, um, th so there are five that we have confirmed. Um, 
There, like the Atlas V isn't on there because it, we don't know when it's supposed to launch. We're assuming next week. There are other like we, we don't make assumptions in the calendar, so it has to be a confirmed date, right? I mean, there are many things. Anyhow, that's going to be fun and interesting. This is a great problem to have, though. It really is a great problem to have. Yeah. I don't think we've ever needed to have this many launches on a show. We'll see what actually ends up. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So you, <laughs> from the chat room, Samuel, this is a great problem to have this many launches. Uh, it, it, it just shows um, kind of a, I don't want to say resurgence, but um, just a, an incredible launch cadence just shows um, how active the space industry is yeah. right now. And I'll be at the SpaceX launch out of Vandenberg on Monday morning. That'll, so. be, that'll be really cool. Pretty nice. Yeah, so. should be exciting. Uh -huh. uh, all right, um, <clears throat> let's get started. This week. Hey, this yeah. week. Yeah. And actually, um, before, sorry, one more thing, one more housekeeping thing before we get into this week. Next week, we're going to be talking about um, uh, a Mars analog station, basically a simulation of Mars um, here on Earth. So they're going to have um, Martians, um, there will be time delayed, we'll be able to speak with Mission Control. But if you, and we'll talk a little bit about this more in the comment section as we're describing next week, but if you have questions for the Mars Analog Station, you're going to need to submit them in advance because just like on Mars, there will be a time delay between the time that we ask the question and the amount of time that they're able to answer. And that time delay is greater than the entire segment length. So if you ask your questions of the simulated Martians this week, like what's it like in, in think of them as, as if they were really on Mars, right? So um, if you had a question for someone who was on Mars today, like what's life like, what, you know, isolations, things like that, ask your question in this week's show. We will forward those questions in advance for next week's show and ask them and try to get those uh, responses for the live show next week and then we'll work with talking to their mission control which would be simulate well not simulated it is here on earth uh, so that's what's coming up next week it's i think it's going to be a really interesting show we've never done anything quite like it but it's going to be a lot like when we do have boots on the ground on mars and you want to do an interview or you want to do a live show with them or you want to talk to them that's what it's really going to be like. Be like. S speed of light delays are a real thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, send in your questions. I think it's going to be uh, really, really interesting. More information on that uh, in our comments section uh, as we get out of the show. All right. Uh, sorry. So enough housekeeping for this particular show. <laughs> Let's get into our main topic, which is the round table for our National Council uh, meeting. Now, before we talk about that, just a really quick, it was a two and a half hour meeting. Here's a quick snippet. Just like if I were to condense the whole meeting down into like two sentences, here it is. The objectives of the National Space Council are clear. The President has charged us with laying the foundation for America to maintain a constant commercial human presence in low Earth orbit. From there, we will turn our attention back toward our celestial neighbors. We will return American astronauts to the moon, not only to leave behind footprints and flags, but to build the foundation we need to send Americans to Mars and beyond. The moon will be a stepping stone, a training ground, a venue to strengthen our commercial and international partnerships as we refocus America's space program toward human space exploration. Okay, so that was, uh, if we were to focus it down, that was kind of the main topic, I would say, of the uh, National Space Council meeting, the very first one. Well, the, I don't want to say the very first one. The, the first one of the new mm -hmm. na of National Space Council 3.0, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. Um, Talking about, and everyone got excited. America's going back to the moon. Uh, we'll start with you, Space Mike. Really? Is that is that is that a real thing? Because uh, I mean, uh, d does the National Space Council have that power? Well, that's the interesting thing about this, because the original National Space Councils and this iteration of the National Space Council is a body that is supposed to make recommendations for space policies, whether it has to do with military or civilian space, or in other words, you know, the DOD or NASA, and give those recommendations to the president, who will then forward his own recommendations to Congress for what the budgets for NASA and military space programs should be. And they don't necessarily have the power. The National Space Council doesn't have the power to make decisions or to direct policy. They, they can offer suggestions, but whether or not they have any authority to do anything, 
I mean, it's, it's pretty clear in the language that when this body was recreated that it's just an advisory body. That's, that's all it's supposed to be. And I was a little uh, surprised by this first meeting. I thought it was actually going to be you know, a meeting at a table and not necessarily a presentation of speeches, so to speak. Uh, I, I will say, I actually thought it was kind of an interesting choice of venue as well. Uh, I think it was Dunham or someone <laughs> yeah. who, who, who found it uh, ironic that they had like the space shuttle behind them as they're talking about the future, um, <laughs> right? Uh, and actually from the chat room, Chris Radcliffe says, uh, I was glad of the tone of the whole meeting, but unfortunately it means nothing until Congress allocates monies to projects. That's how policy is really defined. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. and that seems kind of talking to what you were saying, right? And I had no problem with a lot of the stuff that was being said in that meeting. I mean, even the Constellation program, I liked the why and I liked the, 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 the what, but the problem with that program was the how and how things got, got over budget on, on specific programs. But there was a lot of good ideas and, and good uh, uh, paths that we could have taken through that through that program. So I personally would like to see us go back to the moon, to the surface of the moon, not just the deep space gateway, but to actually go to the surface of the moon and have more Apollo-like missions. I would love to see that before going on to Mars. I also want to see us go on to Mars as well, but I want us to do things the kind of right way. I don't want us to just jump from, you know, international space station operations to doing the first mission to Mars. I want there to be milestones and missions along the way, building up our experience experience collectively to be able to successfully pull off a, a, a Mars mission, a lo Mars surface mission, actually landing on the surface of Mars and being able to return back to Earth. Uh, you know, let's turn it over to Jared and uh, I'll mm -hmm. kind of use Rune's comment from the chat room, which is another empty declaration, show me the monies, um, right? <laughs> Your opinion, like National Space Council, it's a, it's a suggestion body, right? I mean, they don't have the power. It is. It's very much a, a group that puts a note into the suggestion box of the, <laughs> of the administration um, because ultimately it is up to the administration to uh, choose the budget and then send that to Congress. And then Congress basically goes yay or nay. Um, and if they say yay, they approve it. If they say nay, then they add on their markups and whatever they need to um, with things like that. For instance, uh, a great example of that occurred during the fiscal year 2018 budget. Uh, the Trump administration uh, uh, proposed a $561 million cut uh, from, from NASA's uh, budget. Uh, but Congress said, no, you ain't doing that. And they fully restored that $561 million and increased a little bit up to actually to $19.1 billion uh, for NASA's mm. fiscal year budget. And uh, as, as always with things like this, my favorite thing to say um, is uh, from the right stuff, uh, both the, the book and the movie, which is no bucks, no Buck Rogers. So uh, <laughs> if you really want to actually put the exploration forward, and do the technological development and the, the vehicle development and the operational development and other things that are going to come uh, with not just doing Deep Space Gateway, but getting uh, you know beyond flags and footprints, which was mentioned in the speech. Uh, you got to put the money down to do that. Even if you're going to go with a, a public-private partnership um, with a commercial group, you, you still need the money in order to fund uh, that commercial group in order to get there. So. But this committee has no power to allocate money. Um, no, not that I know. Of, so. All right, so we have to have Congress say, because we, we had this happen before, didn't we? Like, um, yes, uh, uh, we the had constellation a, was we're going to go back to the moon and on to <laughs> Mars, but we're not going to give you any money to do it. And we it, saw how well that turned out. It wasn't just constellation, too. Uh, 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 Herbert Walker Bush in 1989, when he reestablished the National Space Council, uh, did uh, the, the plan for America to return um, to the moon and have people on Mars uh, by 2019. So. Um, anyways, uh, and uh, he actually went to Congress and said, hey, I want the budget to increase, you know, give NASA more money. He actually fought uh, for NASA to get the budget that was necessary for it, and Congress did not agree with him um, at the time that it was, it was something that should have money spent on it, and they they ended up reversing course and, and we ended up sort of going into the faster, better, cheaper, uh, less metric, more imperial, whoopsie uh, era of uh, NASA during that time period. So, so uh, I'll open this up to anyone who wants to answer. This is a question from the chat room from Strati, which is what's the big difference between National Space Council 2.0 and National Space Council 3.0. Mm, that is uh, Well, and the reason you're saying 3.0, just to be really clear, is that because uh, the original Council 1.0. Yeah, yeah, was the National mm -hmm. Aeronautics and Space Council, NASC, 
Um, and that was in 1958, but that lasted all the way through 1973, mm -hmm. which is impressive. And then the National Space Council, which was a variation of that, uh, which is why we're saying like 3.0, because they're, mm -hmm. they're just sort of uh, the same theme, if you will, uh, was only from 89 to 93. Right, so we had it during the Apollo era. Mm -hmm. Apollo ended, as did the council. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we kind of said, oh, we want to bring it back, and we brought it back for a little bit. Like yep. late shuttle-esque, like yep. mid-shuttle-esque. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, man, I should know my, that was Reagan era, right? Is that right? Uh, when mm -hmm. the, 89. Yeah, yeah. 89, that was yeah. uh, well, Reagan. So. Reagan was 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 1.0, I, I believe, with the National Space Council. I mean, you're right, actually, that the that the uh, um, uh, the NASC, the the precursor to NASA, is actually mm -hmm. the first kind of advisory council like this. I mm -hmm. didn't even think about that before. But yeah. the original purpose of the National Space Council was primarily to advise on the military aspects mm -hmm. of space. Mm -hmm. At that time, the Cold War was still, you know, uh, kind of reaching its its. It's 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 aftermath almost. I mean, we're we're still kind of in a cold war if you really think about it. But uh, um, with the whole thing with the Soviet Union going on at the time, it was more about like whether or not to do a lot of these projects. And the whole Star Wars program and the propaganda machine about how far we were with the Star Wars program, even though we really weren't, was coming from the National Space Council. The, those ideas were coming from the, the first versions of the National Space Council, and it wasn't so much about the civilian aspects, although what the president acted on, especially with Herbert Walker Bush, was more on the civilian side of things. The primary purpose was to advise about the military aspect of things. Now, we've spoken a little bit about what power legally this National Space Council has, and technically they're only supposed to advise. Let's think about for a minute what sort of unofficial power they actually have. I mean, we have to admit that the current president isn't very um, well versed in space. And Mike Pence definitely seems to be a bit more of a space fan and wants to uh, do a lot of really cool things. You know, he is enthusiastic about these plans. And, you know, his excitement, you know, especially during this first meeting, is, I feel, is sincere. I've, I believe he sincerely wants to do these things and is excited about it. He seemed like a kid but, in a candy store during, the, yeah, during his speech. I he mean, does. he was, he almost yeah. seemed giddy. He was like, let's go to space. I mean, he, he genuinely looked excited. Mm -hmm. But we have to admit that our president now doesn't necessarily have any recommendations for NASA, not, not serious ones anyway. So maybe the unofficial power here is to kind of educate the president and to give what I hope would be the best advice. Now, looking at the other people that are on this council, it seems like there might be some good advice coming out of this. I hope, anyway. Well, actually, and Space Mike, that ties us directly into a question from the, the chat room from Rebel Ace Fr uh, how do you do that? Friesland. Friesland, thank you. <laughs> I don't know why, it's a mental block. Asks, uh, question, who are the Space Council, who are all in the Space Council and can it be increase its members? I think that saying, Sure, we... well, I mean, but that, that goes directly to the uh, the major difference between the 2.0 and the 3.0. Uh, commercial space, the way it is now, basically didn't exist uh, in, you know, in 93, just mm -hmm. not in the same way in any way, shape, or form. So uh, the mm -hmm. big difference is with the people who are involved on the Space Council now, uh, it, that that's a huge differentiating, you know, essentially just you have different people who are giving their opinion Right. Uh, so while uh, it is really just opinion and everyone kind of goes, all right, this is a, a good suggestion. Yeah, we all agree on this. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Here you go. This is what we think. At least there's it is a, a slightly broader spectrum and it's a lot of uh, what could be considered the main players in not just the old space as well as the new space, uh, but the commercial space industry. Um, are, are being able to put their opinions well, in. Well, I think there's a different, yeah, they're able to put their opinions in, but they're not actually on the council, I believe, right? So we had testimony from Boeing and Lockheed and uh, Orbital ATK, SpaceX, Blue, SpaceX, Blue Or like everyone and their friends came right, in. And what was interesting to listen to is everyone seemed fairly um, pro Space Council. Mm -hmm. Now that might have just mm -hmm. been posturing, but it didn't seem it. It seemed kind of like, yeah, no, this, this doesn't seem like a bad idea. Uh, so the Space Council was definitely listening to those people, but back to the original question is, who's on the Space Council? So the I, I vice, got it, if yeah, you want it. Yeah, so, got it? Uh, oh, yeah, so the, the, cur the current That's people who are, who are on the Space Council, um, Pence is chairing it. Yep. Uh, also, Pace is on it as well. 
Um, in addition to that, we have Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State, James Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, Elaine Chow, the Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Duke, the Acting Secretary of Homeland Security, Mike Mulvaney, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, H.R. McMaster, the National Security Advisor, Daniel Coates, the Director of National Intelligence, Robert Lightfoot, Jr., the Acting NASA Administrator, uh, Michael Kratzios, the Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States, and General Paul J. Selva, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So it seemed very military slash um, cabinet level members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yes. yes. Uh, but that's how it traditionally was. Yes. So these are these yes. are essentially dis uh, uh, national policy decision makers in in on this council. And, so. and you have the, the council from 89 to 93. It looked very there, similar, yeah, right? Yeah, Secretary mm -hmm. of Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Defense, uh, Commerce, Transportation, Director of, uh, or sorry, Chief of Staff of the President, Assistant of the President, National Security Affairs, I mean, same kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Assistant of the President for Science and Technology, which I thought was interesting, and Director of Central Intelligence, uh, as well as the admin for NASA. But this talks to, you know, we had Robert Walker on a few episodes ago, and I mm -hmm. think this talks to, um, he, he mentioned, you know, it's, the Space Council is kind of trying to look at all of these sectors, commercial aerospace, which, as you aptly pointed out, didn't really exist like it does today yeah. uh, back in Council 1.0 uh, and 2.0. Um, you know, times have changed. In Council 1.0, it was all about Apollo and going to the moon and things like that. Um, and then we've got, um, you know, Council 2.0, where um, it's, it's shuttle era and whatnot. Now, 3.0, it's the era of commercial space. So um, there was a lot more talk of commercial and what commercial can do. There was a lot of talk of uh, putting boots on Mars and a, a lot of talk of going back to the moon. Um, but, yeah, and, and, and as Uncle Bill mentions, you know, not a single scientist or engineer in the whole lot. Uh, but I'm not yeah. sure, like, again, what Robert Walker mentioned was that this is really designed to get these different areas, commercial space, military space, um, uh, uh, I don't want to call it spy space, but uh, what do you want to no, say? No, but I mean, you got state, uh, defense, commerce, transportation, no. homeland security, <laughs> national intelligence, you know, all focusing on space. It all still matters. Like, those, those are still major players in the space industry, even though, you know, on our side of things, it doesn't feel like it, right? Like, those are going to be the people who are going to be the customers of NASA, of uh, Boeing, of Blue Origin, of, you know, SpaceX, like whatever, those are the people, if they want to get something into space and they're not doing it themselves, who do they go to? They go to commercial space. Sure. You know I, what I'm saying? I feel like uh, there wasn't a lot of mention of science in this because the, the uh, science at NASA has very clear goals. Mm -hmm. It's not something where we're walking through the dark with our hands in front like this, you know, NASA science. Sometimes it feels like that, it, though. It can feel that way <laughs> in terms of when we're selecting <laughs> missions and things. But once something is selected, it's very clear cut as to what this mission is doing, what the objectives are, and what that mission has to do. Occasionally, you get something like James Webb that that has so many technical curveballs that they end up hitting the ground and smashing you in the face a couple times. Um, hopefully not the, not the mirror. With <laughs> yes, hopefully yeah. not the mirror. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, but I feel like science wasn't really talked about um, because it's very clear in the goals as to what NASA's science directorate is doing. It's not like NASA's human space flight program right now where we have the International Space Station, but everybody's asking, what happens after this? For NASA's science uh, directorate, uh, we have uh, the, the decadal survey that basically tells us what we wanted or what we sh suggest uh, to NASA what should happen for the next decade. So that's already taken care of. It's the human side that is really the big unknown. See, Aspen in the chat room is saying we should have scientific and engineer types on it. Um, you know, I just I don't know that I completely agree on that. I think as long as you can get uh, these sort of quote unquote non-scientific, non-engineer types to agree that they need the engineering scientific uh, companies to do what they need, you yeah, know what I'm see, saying? I, I agree, I, like you look at James Webb uh, Space Telescope and that's what happens when you give scientists all of the power uh, and like they, they want to put yeah. everything on it. You it, need right, all yeah. of the checks right. and balances. So you need the check, I agree, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, as long as the council listens to the scientists and the right. engineers, that's important. And it seems like they were, right? Would you agree, right? I mean... It, uh, I think so, yeah. I the, feel the, like, uh, yeah, for the people that were there and the, and the things that were talked about, they, 
you know, for, for, from what I saw anyway, it seemed like they were very enthusiastic. Like everything was pretty much well received. A lot of the people who testified, to, you know, we were saying testified, but I almost feel like it was it was presenting almost. You know, there was a few uh, random things that people talked about, like what their company was focusing on, and it seemed like it was all very well received. So. Yeah, I feel like it was a very positive response, and I hope that as things continue, that these policymakers—that's what the, is the important thing here—is that mm -hmm. these policymakers and the people who are making the decisions. I mean, National Reconnaissance Office gets a higher budget than NASA does, for crying out loud. Right. Um, <laughs> These are the people who I want to be sitting in a room, listening to those type of people, listening to scientists, listening to engineers, listening to chief technology officers and CEOs of companies trying to do these innovative things and you know, actually listening and, and taking into account what they had to say and being able to connect the dots in ways that maybe they hadn't before. And be able to have that good path, you know. The, I mean, the, the kind of the other stated goal of the National Space Council is so that we have a program that survives from administration to administration. I'm sorry for uh, um, going off on a rant here, but that's kind of the point here, so that we can have a path forward for NASA that won't get canceled and changed every time we change presidents. Yes. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. but when we talked to <laughs> Robert Walker, that wasn't necessarily. I, I believe his line was. The council works at the behest of the president, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. um, that will change. That uh, that's what we I think what we as space nerds want, right? We don't want NASA to constantly shift directions every four to eight years. Yeah. That's but you can't have a long term vision that works that way. So if you yeah. have this council, then then it's going to um, uh, it's going to act as almost like an advisory board to whoever's sitting in that chair, yes? Yeah, and mm -hmm. actually, as Dan TC24 yeah. says in the chat room, having, the most, uh, having most of the membership directly report to the president is good because it means the executive branch can speak with one voice as it advocates for these projects in Congress. This makes it more likely that funding for these projects will materialize. And that's fundamentally what the council is doing. What it will not do, unfortunately, uh, at least not at this time, is be that overarching thing that lasts more than four to eight years yeah. because at, at, at a maximum, it's going to, um, I don't want to say it's going to change, but the, the, the office of the president will change. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at what the presidential priorities for, for crewed space flight were at that time, Reagan, it was shuttle, 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 shuttle. Sure. Bush, it was moon, Mars. We're going to go to the moon, and then we're going to go to Mars. For Clinton, it switched, and they went, we need to keep Russian engineers employed, International Space Station. And then after that, when Bush came in, um, it was kind of a continuation of that until the Columbia accident. And then they basically switched mid-administration and basically said, okay, no, we're going to do moon to Mars. And then the Obama administration came in, and it was, it was suddenly, uh, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to grab an asteroid and put it around the moon and do it that way. And now... With a new administration, we've got potentially a new focus coming into here. Again, again. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. I, and, yeah. Focus, yeah. refocus. We keep going back to what I call the original plan. You know, the original plan when Werner von Braun was still helping to design a lot of the missions was after Apollo, we were going to have several different applications, you know, doing Skylab and building a space station to be a stepping stone towards more missions to the moon and mm -hmm. to missions to Mars and hopefully get to Mars in the 1980s. And we've accomplished a, a parts of those programs. You know, we did the space shuttle, we built the International Space Station, but we're not necessarily utilizing it as that stepping stone to go to the moon and to go to Mars. We're using it as a national laboratory which is fine we're doing great research and there's been some great breakthroughs that have happened up there but we keep shifting back and forth to what like I said I think of as the original plan building the space station continuing missions to the moon and going to Mars so one and thing we keep that, going back and forth while the Space Council <laughs> does work at the behest of the president one thing it may be able to do especially with something like um, um, well especially with the current administration is say, look, this is what we suggest. This is what we think the best path forward for America is. Uh, because ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what the Space Council is here for, is for America. Mm -hmm. uh, it will, hopefully, the rest of the world will benefit as well, but they're, they're here to serve Americans. They're paid for by Americans, American tax dollars. That's what they're there for. So this is the best path forward for America. And then when a new president comes in, hopefully that council can say, OK, rather than doing this huge shift in policy, it's best if we for the most part, stay the course. Now, I'm not saying that that's what will happen, but they can at least make that suggestion of like, of saying, look, 
Mr. President, it does not make sense for us to switch from Moon Mars to asteroid and then back to Moon Mars and then back to an asteroid. Like, if we keep doing this, this is not going to ever advance our space program. We should continue down this path, um, or we should cancel it entirely, or you know, whatever, whatever. The that only may consistency be. that comes out of that is being stuck in low Earth orbit. Which we're very good at, which we yes. become very good at. So mm -hmm. we can hope that that's a thing that will happen, but uh, we don't actually we don't actually know. So a couple of things. Uh, sure. I appreciate that you think that our next president is going to be male. Uh, and then, <laughs> All right, that's fair. Actually, that was a uh, yeah. That's True. Not yeah. not fair on my part. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then uh, for those of you following uh, current sort of themes, particularly when women in meetings, uh, think of the council as just a, a sheep eating. Uh, which is to say that uh, one woman has uh, has an idea, mm -hmm. and then it maybe gets overlooked, and then another woman in the same exact meeting repeats it until the point where it actually gets heard. That's kind of what this council could be in theory, is that if they come up with a good idea, and it and whatever president is sitting there says, mm, not really feeling that one, hey, what about that old shuttle thing? I really liked that. Let's bring that back. That the council can sit there and go, Yes, no, we love the shuttle, absolutely. Uh, but let's continue forward on and just mm -hmm. keeps repeating the, the good ideas, just trying to break through the uh, possible older thinking of whatever president is sitting there instead of making those huge sweeping yeah. changes across the board. You know, mm -hmm. building off of that idea of the, uh, you know, just constantly having the same, uh, same, not same idea, but pushing um, a single idea from multiple directions. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing that was interesting with this council was that they did bring in all of the commercial space sector, old mm -hmm. and new, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we had Boeing, we yep. had Lockheed, we had Blue Origin, we had SpaceX, we had yeah. Orbital ATK, we had all of these companies coming in. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, from what I could tell, they almost all said about the same thing, which is, yes, Moon, yes, Mars, let's do this, we've got plans, we've got the technology, let's do this. So not only do we have a government body that's kind of on board with some of these things now, now we've got all of these old and new space companies that seem to be saying the exact same things. So when you go to Congress and you go to the President, you've got not just this council saying this, but you've got U.S. industry saying this as well. Uh, you've got all of the people that work in those companies as well, the constituents for these uh, uh, people in Congress uh, that help to bolster this idea. So it's, it's coming from, as you said, all of these different areas. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that could potentially help, uh, at least in the short term. And speaking of the short term, right now, the White House, the Senate, and the House are all controlled by Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. that gives them a unique opportunity to push through an agenda that they want um, and something like space seems like an easier agenda to push through. So let's just say yeah. that the everybody the, loves space. What? Well, yeah, yeah, there's fifty-one percent of people love space. In right? general, that's, that's what we pull at. In no, Congress, really, really. I mean, I just mean in Congress mm. and with lawmakers. Like, there's not anyone who necessarily is just like, no, we got to cancel NASA, everything. It's all a waste of money. Like, generally, Republicans and Democrats are pretty pro-space for the most part. Right. They may not agree on which direction to go, but. But it seems all, like if the National Space Council and business are saying, yes, let's return to the moon to stay and go on to Mars and let's make this a priority, it seems like maybe now is the time when we could see that funding increase to actually make that happen. Yes. Does that seem mm -hmm. like something you think would happen? And there's actually arguments in the chat room going back earlier saying funding increases may not happen because NASA would just waste that money away. Um, and I'm, I, we'll talk about that maybe in a bit or on a different show. But do, do you, I, you know, as you said, no no bucks, no Buck Rogers, yeah. which I'm not convinced millennials understand that reference, but okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'm a rare it's millennial. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, but I think, uh, do we all agree, I'm asking, do we all agree if there's no funding increase, this is not happening? Is that a fair yeah. statement? Yeah, however, it, <sighs> Even if there's not more money, if there's still the same amount of money, but the way that things are contracted changes, it could still happen. Because over the past several years, over the past decade, you know, we've seen things change from these cost plus contracting models to having these fixed price milestone based contracts, you know, with the, the commercial cargo resupply program and now with the commercial crew program. So I foresee that if we do decide on a path forward like this, that NASA and the government itself is going to be contracting these companies to do uh, lunar missions for a fixed, fixed price milestone based contract and not have these huge ambitious programs that go off in all these different directions and, and 
of course, don't have enough money to pay for everything. So I see that things, the way that things have been developing with these contracts over the past couple of years might change how we go to the moon and how we go to Mars. And the companies, of course, are just be like, we'll do whatever you want, you know, as long as you're willing to pay for it. Of course, that's, that's Lockheed and Boeing's attitude most of the time with most projects. You know, if, if the government's willing to pay for it, of course, we'll do whatever, whatever you want. And, and here's a, at least an estimate of how much that might cost. They're getting a little bit better about their estimates. But yeah, I think that things could potentially change, even if there isn't a drastic increase in funding. If just the way that NASA and the government does business with these commercial companies, I think that we could still see a very impressive space future. Uh, you know, and I can't comment too much on this, but if you look at Gwen Shotwell's testimony from SpaceX, she basically said, I believe it was in, in that testimony, basically saying, yeah, look, do the COTS model. The COTS model worked really well. Mm -hmm. Continue the COTS model. So Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you talked, Mike, about NASA actually looking at a lunar COTS uh, program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not only are they looking through the Next Step program for to have commercial habitats to potentially build their deep space gateway, but they're looking at lunar cots to deliver cargo and payloads to the surface of the moon. And at first it might be a lot of scientific instruments, not necessarily cargo for a base or whatever, but once there is something, whether it be international or commercial based, then that could be a program that NASA would be a part of. I mean, the, the, the building blocks are being set in place right now. We just got to connect the dots. It's a good uh, differentiation to say, uh, you know, when uh, there's the phrase that always gets thrown around, to the moon, to Mars, and beyond, right? Mm -hmm. And it's 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 not even cliche anymore. It's it was empty to start, if you will. Uh, but when you say that you're going to the moon, that there's a differentiation between going in the neighborhood of the moon, kind of mm -hmm. just hanging mm -hmm. out, sort of around the moon, hey, and moon. going down Hi, to the surface of the moon. It's mm. a distinctly different thing. Uh, it's just to be clear on that one, which is why we're, we're, we keep different. Yeah, I mean, Apollo 80 and around the moon is a lot easier than actually like doing a lunar injection, orbiting the moon, and then landing right. on it, and then getting back off the moon and coming back home. The, or I putting mean, satellites in orbit of the sure, moon. Like there's the, sure. all of those different things. Uh, uh, it's a completely different thing to, than to talk about landers, boots, flags, digging, uh, you know, colonies, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, it's a different. It's a different Which thing. We don't even know when that could potentially happen. That number that NASA keeps throwing around of, you know, humans to Mars in the 2030s is for an orbital mission. It's just maybe even right. just a flyby mission. That's not even for, uh, you know, human footprints on the ground. Not human, but, you know, boots sure. on the ground. Right. And I also want to point out, yeah. too, that there is a tremendous amount of science that we still need to do about the actual moon itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've only brought back maybe about 400 kilograms of lunar material. That's including both the Apollo missions and the uh, Soviet Luna missions that brought back uh, material from the moon as well. Yeah. We don't know a lot about the surface of the moon, actually. We don't know much about anything deeper than just uh, just the first like meter or two in the moon. And mm -hmm. the amount of scientific return you can get from an actual geologist on the moon with a laboratory on the moon. Holy smokes. Like, I... I that, that makes me very excited to think about enabling that possibility because we still don't know a lot. Apollo taught us a lot, but we ended up getting a lot more questions uh, than, than questions answered during those missions. All right, so, I think the last question yeah. from the chat room, and then we're going to go to break and come back from comments. Uh, and if, as always, by the way, we'd love to hear what you guys think of the National Space Council. Leave all your comments in Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, wherever you want. We'll bring them back into uh, next week's show. Uh, but this is for uh, everyone on the panel here. Uh, this is from Rebel Ace, which is, do you find that there's still... Uh, don't find that there's really a space policy from the White House, which is concerning, but isn't that what the Space Council is for, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Educate the White House on what makes sense from space policy and mm -hmm. go from there, rather than just being like, well, this, this White House wants to go to an asteroid, and now this new White House wants to go to the moon, and now yeah. this next new White House doesn't want to do any of it, right? I yeah. mean, is, isn't that what we're kind of... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I was impressed, sort of impressed with the, with at least that there was a budget put out for the for the next fiscal year by the White House for their proposal for the budget, and that things were resolved with it pretty quickly. It didn't it didn't seem like the the the, the White House had a whole lot of objections with the changes that Congress and the Senate made, um, and. 
I was at least surprised, though, at what language was in there and how they wanted to, to change the focus. I mean, there was quite a few things that we, you know, both me and Jared disagreed with, with their whole earth science cutting and, and uh, mm -hmm. moving different programs around. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of the other things, for the commercial space program and for the ISS and for a lot of the other programs, I was surprised actually by what recommendations were in there and how Congress and the Senate kind of changed things around. And I was pretty happy with how things uh, ended up with, uh, with, with that particular budget and surprised at how early it was finished. <laughs> First time it's been on time in a long time. Yes, <laughs> quite a long time. Gary and Jared, uh, your thoughts on... Um... Uh, the Space Council in, in the White House? So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about the Space Council after this meeting, you know, um, especially bringing on commercial companies to do it. That, that really kind of eases some of my, my s skepticism I had and, and also some of the hardcore cynicism um, I have had about the National Space Council as well because bringing on commercial companies is going to enable exploration beyond what you can just do with a strictly with strictly NASA at the helm. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what commercial companies bring to the table simply beyond the meetings that happened this week. Um, this is a good start. I'm really excited to see what's going to happen, um, especially over the next year or two. Um, because if we're going to be fair, the Obama administration didn't really lay down its, its official plans for what it wanted to do for spaceflight. Um, even though the inauguration happened January 2009, it wasn't until April 2010 uh, when the, the actual space policy came out. Um, so. I'm not too particularly worried about the fact that that nothing, no real hard policy has come out yet because the previous administration it did take 15 months for that to come out after they were they were put in. Um, but I, I'm I'm gonna stay as hopeful as I can, um, and I think uh, I think a little bit of that that cynicism and skepticism that I had of, with some of the initial choices uh, is is being massaged out um, mm -hmm. with with some of the moves that they're actually making. So. Uh, speaking, I'm, I mean, Chris Radcliffe put it so eloquently, he says, uh, we could still end up with the same problem, council or no, the administration will still need to set some kind of policy, and it's still going to change from administration to administration. Uh, yeah, uh, I kind of feel that way as well, but uh, along the lines of what Jared is saying, it is nice that the conversation does get opened up with the inclusion of uh, everyone who was there, really. Uh, it, it's nice that they are being... Um, added to the conversation, if you will, even if at, at the end of the day they still go, that's cool, and do whatever it is that they want to do, which is definitely a possibility, mm -hmm. an option. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's nice to see, at the very least, the consideration of everyone else's opinions. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll say that um, the thing that surprised me and got me um, so somewhat on board with the council was uh, seeing Vice President Pence's uh, almost schoolboy enthusiasm for space and having you know despite your political affiliations because I, I don't mm -hmm. think those are relevant here um, having someone who is a space geek heading up a space council who appears to on the surface at least truly care about these issues uh, in my opinion is, is a good thing um, I may not agree with everything uh, whether I agree or disagree with the administration uh, from a space standpoint um, I did not agree with the previous administration's path forward, mm -hmm. um, and I seem to be more agreeing with what the Space Council is saying now. Um, it seems to be more of an inspirational plan, uh, and that gets me excited because when you can inspire the masses and you can get them behind what you're doing, then the funding can start to flow and you can start to do cool things. Um, I was never, like the asteroid recovery mission was really cool from a science standpoint. It was just not inspirational at all. I mean, it was truly lacking inspiration. <laughs> uh, but putting boots on the moon and a colony to stay, putting boots on Mars uh, and building a colony to stay, I think that's an easy thing. As you point out quite correctly, you can look at the moon from anywhere on Earth and you, you can see it uh, and you can understand it uh, and, and you, can, you can be inspired by, by the idea that humans are there. And so um, I, I'm hopeful that the council is able to help push that forward. Now, we'll, a, a, as you, I think everyone has mentioned, the council doesn't have the power to do these things. I'm hopeful that it acts as a unifying voice between Congress and the White House to stop some of this um, unnecessary uh, 
back and forth of like, uh, you know, fighting between budget and policy and all this other fun jazz of, well, I want to have my way, no, I want to have my way, and I'm hoping we can come up with a unified vision. It may not work out that way, time will tell, uh, but I think um, on the surface, the initial beginning part of this, uh, I was actually pleasantly surprised. How's that? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm still a little skeptical. I'm, I still want to see if they can actually accomplish anything. But uh, I'm a little more excited now than I was before uh, about, I think, where, where they're going. But we, we shall see. All right. Um, uh, if you have comments on this, if you have thoughts and ideas, uh, you know, people get really passionate with politics. And, and that's OK. Just remember to debate the idea and not the person. So don't take personal digs at each other. Uh, but certainly feel free to uh, debate ideas. Uh, that's how we become better people, is we learn through uh, debate and ideas. And don't get so stuck in your idea that it's the only possible way forward. Maybe someone else has a valid point. Maybe you have a valid point. Maybe everyone, who knows? So just be kind to other people online. Our community seems to be fantastic at that. I just wanted to remind everyone, because politics does become kind of one of those passionate things. So remember, debate the idea, not the person. Uh, leave that on Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, YouTube. YouTube, wherever you want. We'll pull out the best of those ideas and we'll bring them up on next week's show. And speaking of, we're going to take a quick calendar break to go over some of those many, many launches coming up next week. And then when we come back, comments from last week's show. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Look into her face, determination in her eyes. She won't give up a quit or for what little fashion lies. Fill the thoughts of expectation. This girl's a fascination. Welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from last week's show, a shout out to all of the people who've made this specific segment possible. These are our Escape Velocity patrons. They've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We also have our Orbital patrons who've contributed $5 or more to this specific episode and our Suborbital patrons. These are people who've contributed $2.50 or more to this specific uh, episode. And uh, they get a bunch of different rewards, including After Dark as soon as it's available on demand. Um, they get... Um, uh, the access to the rundown in advance, a bunch of really cool things. And find out what those rewards are and how you can help these shows continue week after week. Head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, what was uh, uh, Capcom? Help us out with uh, what was our show last week? <laughs> Were you asleep? <laughs> what was it about? Last week. So, yeah, <laughs> actually, uh, for those who don't know, uh, last week's show, I was not on last week's show because I had just returned from Australia, which is a 16-something hour plane ride. I got off the airplane, jumped into a cab or an Uber, um, went home, dropped off my luggage, went to Starbucks to grab some coffee, came straight here, and I desperately tried to stay awake for the show, but I ended up asleep on the couch that's directly to my left. <laughs> Which, that so, was very <laughs> funny to be sitting here talking and then looking over just to get some some, some little, feedback. Some and then feedback, Benson. and then I'd see just... <laughs> I was exhausted. Like, I was up for, going good. I was so. up for well over 20 hours on that. Oh my, oh my. I was exhausted. So, uh, what was that show? What was uh, that show? Yeah, it was uh, talking about IAC 2017, in particular, Elon Musk's update to BFR. That's the Big Falcon Rocket. Right. <laughs> yep. Because MCG is just a stupid name. <laughs> <laughs> Which we, right. we talked about BFR at our, our monthly show at Griffith last night, mm -hmm. and yep. the entire audience, including us, uh, who talked about it, cracked up when we <laughs> talked about it as a big falcon rocket. It is a big so, falcon rocket. Yeah, it's a really big falcon rocket. <laughs> <laughs> right. Falcons are part of the raptor species of birds. And they're yeah. big. And they're very, they're very large. It's a big falcon rocket. That's what it is, a BFR. <laughs> All right, <laughs> first up. Yeah. Anyway, first comment comes off of YouTube. <laughs> God. From Untied Music Studio, also known as Vax Hedrum. Hey, case, Vax. In the chat room in case uh, you Hi, Emery. Hi, Emery. Uh, says, uh, the really interesting thing about SpaceX's plan is something nobody has ever been able to do before. Stockpile rockets and reuse them enough times to be able to continue the business without having to build more new rockets, F9, FH, and then take the manufacturing base offline and transition to a new model while the old ones are still flying. That's enough of a paradigm shift that they might actually be able to pull it off. 
So uh, due to conflict of interest, Karen and I need to bow out of that one. But Mike and Jared, your thoughts? Go ahead, Mike. With uh, Mike's mic yeah. off. There you go. Oh, one more time. No, no, that was us. That was us. Go, go ahead, ahead go Mike. Ahead. That's us. That was us. I think that um, uh, there would still need to be some sort of like, um, not necessarily factory, but like refurbishment center for one, times when they might have like extra stress or like an extra mission and you know, you'd know you lose some along the way. But they might be able to. I'm very hopeful that SpaceX can be able to do that and that they can make the business case work in that sense. Mm -hmm. I think it's really or cool. What do you think, Jared? Uh, I think it's really cool because this is literally like, a, like a, almost reaching the point of being like an aircraft manufacturer where mm -hmm. you build a fleet uh, f specifically for, uh, for a customer that may end up actually doing that. And that may be potentially the future of rocket building. You know, maybe uh, maybe United Airlines is gonna wanna purchase uh, uh, a couple Falcons, Falcon 9s and, and Dragons and the associated operations with them so that they can have a point, their own point-to-point -point, uh, method of, of, of taking people around. I don't know, that sounds absurd, but... But, Does uh, it? I mean, that's but, what the spaceship but, company in Virgin Galactic But do, five of. years ago, everybody said reusable rockets were absurd. So I don't know. Some, it, this could yeah. be like the beginning of literally building rocket fleets for companies outside of just who's making the rockets. And, uh, and who knows how long that can go for as well. I mean, if you look at Boeing and the 737, that's been, in, that's been continuously upgraded in manufacturing and other things like that for almost 50 years, if not 50 years uh, with it. So, yeah. yeah. Dada, Dada had a, Dada so in other words, the way things are going now, guys, we need to get to our next funding goal so that we can fund the space program of tomorrow. We got to buy some of our own <laughs> Oh my God, that would be <laughs> awesome. Space to get things going, come on. That's hilarious. Uh, Dada had an interesting comment, and I'll actually just, uh, uh, rather than read it, Dada, why don't you go ahead and, uh, w what's your thought process on that? Well, you, you know, you buy a 2009 Ford Focus or whatever, and you get into a fender bender, you need to replace a fender. So you, there's Ford makes a surplus of 2009 Ford Focus fenders so that you can do that. Why not do that with rocket parts? Mm -hmm. So SpaceX makes you know Falcons to the, to their their orders. There's no reason they can't make a surplus of extra parts, the parts that are highly stressed, the parts that wear out, etc., and be able to replace and refurbish as required. But in the meantime, they've moved their production on to BFR. That just the visual of like 200 and some odd years from now. I was like, oh no, I have a vintage <laughs> 2017 Falcon 9. <laughs> just uh, I had to get that, the special points for that because I'm a D collector. Turbo pump. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> that's 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 close to the 2018 model, but it doesn't quite fit. But if it's you modify like, it like this, it's a little different, a little different. But <laughs> that just cracks me up to no end. It's well, co it's the, cool that we can <laughs> talk about this though, because yeah. and consider this that you know maybe maybe. Maybe the business model may change or, you, you know, um, like I said, spaceship uh, company versus Virgin Galactic where they're like, look, Virgin Galactic is the operations company. They operate the, the space planes, but we don't build them. Mm -hmm. Kind of like mm -hmm. Boeing doesn't fly their own fleet of airplanes yeah. with commercial passengers. They just build them and then sell them to other people. Maybe there'll be a company that comes on and starts doing that. How thick would the Haynes manual for a big Falcon rocket be? <laughs> would it be like, would it come in like volumes? No, I think we just XKCD or? it and just be like up goer at nine. Right? Like, and then it's fine. It's totally fine. Uh, and for anyone wondering, the main difference between the 2017 models and the 2018 models of the F9 would be the grid fins. So. Yeah. As Chris Radcliffe <laughs> in the chat room says, Block 5 grid fin. Oh. <laughs> Falcon 9 full thrust, 2015 to 2019 owner's manual. Yeah. yeah who knows? Maybe 100 years from now, uh, you know, after, uh, what was it, the, the first uh, barge landing, someone jokingly on Craigslist put up uh, an ad yes. for it. A hundred years from now, that may not be a joke. Yeah. Um, so that may be an actual thing. All right, moving on. Next up. Next uh, one comes off of YouTube from SP123100. Says, uh, am I right to assume that the point-to-point -point version of the BFR, Big Falcon rocket, would be co would cause a sonic boom on landing like the Falcon 9 Stage 1 landings? The video seems to indicate that it would be coming down from a mile offshore from major cities. But the residents won't be happy being shaken out of their beds for late at night rivals. You're gonna hear me say this for almost every comment, uh, Carrie and I will need to bow out due to conflict of interest. <laughs> Mike and Jared, take that away. Oh, come on, I, I'm good. I don't understand. Right. So strange. Uh, so, Mike, your thoughts? Uh, there was some discussion of this in pre-show. What do you think? 
Yeah, we talked about this a little bit. Um, I mean, it, just from the, that uh, demo video, I mean, it does look like there would be sonic booms, but I mean, I don't know. I think that it, if we did have something like this, it would need to be landing sites and, and launching sites would need to be further away from, from major cities. Mm -hmm. I, even, if we, if, even if people were so confident in the landing technology that SpaceX could do pinpoint landings every single time and had full confidence, I still don't think that they would be able to have something that would like, you know, be in harbors of major cities like that. I think that things would be much further further away and there might not be as many but I don't know if there seems to be a lot of really positive interest in point to point from the people who have the money to make it actually happen so I wish I could have done as it. ridiculous as it sounds like there are people with serious mo loads of cash here who are actually interested and want to further that and make it happen they don't care about the rest of the space stuff they just care about that part of it so well let me tell even you though that just like Jared said it sounds absurd it could happen no that flight from Australia was miserable not because the airline was awful it's just it, being stuck in a metal tube for 16 hours sucks doesn't matter how many amenities you add to it, it just sucks, right? So I would have loved a 30 minute to an hour long flight. That would have been delightful for me to do, even if I have to get on a boat and just go international waters to international waters. I personally would have loved that. Yeah, so um, I just wanna point out that in 1964, there was a study done by the Federal Aviation Administration, NASA, and the Air Force uh, that they basically uh, caused multiple sonic booms every day for a, a near six month period um, in Oklahoma City in order to uh, quantify the effects of a supersonic transport system. Wait, for how? Um, for six going months? Going over. For six months they, they drove no an idea. entire city crazy? Yep, that's exactly what for happened. Fun? They did sociological <laughs> and economic <laughs> impact study. Did they tell anyone they were going to do it? So they did, they basically said... <laughs> So, That's amazing. What so, was the Falcon? What are they thinking? So, okay, go on. so basically, okay, look. <laughs> just like what was the result that, of that was great. <laughs> just like, just like the people who lived around Beale Air Force Base when the SR seventy ones would take off to go do spying, they would basically be like, "That's the sound of freedom." You know, suck it up for the love. <laughs> Do you love your country? Do you love your God? Then you will love these sonic booms. Sure. So, uh, what, was the, what was the result? What was the result? The result. Oklahoma City vacated. So basically, <laughs> so here's here's the results of the experiment. Could, the overwhelming majority felt that they could learn to live with the numbers and kinds of booms experience, experienced. 73% of subjects in the study said that they could live indefinitely with eight sonic booms per day, while 25% said that they couldn't. So, but, very interestingly, about 3% of the population telephoned, telephoned, sued, or wrote protest letters in to Every single this time. Year. Excuse so, me, sir. What was that? So the city population at that time was about 500,000. Um, so that <laughs> means that they... Vacated. So the 3% figure represents about 15,000 upset individuals, uh, and they received 4,901 claims that were lodged against the United States government, mostly for cracked glass and plaster. So that's, that's a fair assessment, right? Because Mm -hmm. if you don't have the soundproofing, you don't have the structural integrity on your houses or the cities that are closest to where those things are going off. I, that's a completely legit thing. Mm -hmm. I think actually what we should do, and we being the general populace, mm -hmm. I suppose, uh, you can ask uh, places like, how about Waco, Texas? Waco is relatively oh, yeah. close to McGregor, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, they they definitely hear stuff down there. I don't know how often they hear it or, or whatever, but somebody mm -hmm. has to have, besides just this one, crazy study in the 60s mm -hmm. was there more uh it was just basically that they ended the faa actually had to end up uh paying out a class action lawsuit um the government <laughs> appealed and lost the appeal and in addition to that the negative uh publicity from it influenced the, can the cancellation of boeing's uh, 2707 supersonic transport project oh. so because it was but, so poorly received but two things to add to that one uh <laughs> for supersonic flight and i realize we're getting way off topic so i'll re reel it in but just two thoughts for supersonic flight i understand NASA is working on a way to muffle the sonic booms uh -huh. of airplanes. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> a muffled sonic boom might be more acceptable. And two, back in the 60s, the soundproofing technologies we had for houses was yeah. radically right. less. Right. Like, oh, we've great. got a newer house, and I, I'm not sure, I mean, a sonic boom would still be loud, but it would be very muffled 
through our walls and windows if today. If you're yeah. watching TV, we barely hear the, the fireworks at Disney. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, although a sonic boom is a little more. I just want to point out yeah, two things, um, which is that, first of all, rockets are really loud. Good yes. luck <laughs> getting mm -hmm. rockets to be very, very quiet, um, yeah. simply just because of the physics of yeah. that. Uh -huh. Right. Um, also, number two, um, having lived in the Los Angeles area during the space shuttle program myself, um, the, 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 so sonic booms were not a frequent thing because the space shuttle didn't always land at Edwards, um, but when the space shuttle did land at Edwards and the sonic boom, came through the Los Angeles area, mm -hmm. you knew that that was a sonic boom. There was, it was, it would, did not sound like uh, fireworks or anything like that. Um, it would, it's, it's it a would, lot. it is a significant pressure wave that rolls through. And that is something that you really do have to think about. And it's not something that's localized either. It goes out in every direction from your vehicle coming back. And again, doesn't apply to rockets, but for airplanes, mm -hmm. if we can muffle it, plus yes. modern technology, that Sweet. might help. Mm -hmm. Supersonic air flight. Yeah. For rockets, I'm not sure how we deal with that. Yeah. Moving on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, next comment uh, actually comes off of Patreon from a Stuart Turner. Thank you for being a patron, Stuart. Yeah. Thank you, Stuart. Yeah. It says uh, most of the flights at SpaceX sells are commercial GTO or uh, geotransfer orbit launches. That plus NASA are their bread and butter. If the BFR Big Falcon rocket works for those, then it can pay for itself. Now, granted, Stuart said a lot more other things, but I want to get to <laughs> these hence, two points. Hence the dot dot dot. Yep. yep. Uh, the BFR Big Falcon Rock is a little oversized for the boring work, but nothing like last year's version. It will work for the routine launches that keep the doors open, which means they'll stay open long enough for Elon to throw a few extra ships to Mars. And that's how SpaceX does awesome things. Due to a conflict of interest, Karen and I will need to bow out of this. Never with your disclaimer. I want to agree. I, I, I hope so. I mean, even though a lot of those things might be considered boring, and a lot of people <laughs> laugh and still think it's silly when they saw the BFR dock to the International Space Station. I thought you know, it looked if amazing. If it can do all of those, <laughs> I thought it was cool. I was fine with it. I didn't think it was silly at all. But if it can do those things, if it can do all those GTO missions, and if it can do the commercial uh, uh, resurfacing of the space station with cargo and crew, mm -hmm. then why not? Why couldn't it pay for itself that way? And if they still have these reusable Falcons to uh, you know, be able to service other customers as well who don't want a BFR every single time, then yeah, I don't see a problem with it. I hope, I hope that they can uh, pull this off. Yeah. I hope that they can pull it off too. Um, I remember last week we were talking about literally launching. Why launch? Uh, why do seven launches to get your Iridium constellation up when you can do one launch uh, and get your entire Iridium constellation up? Yes. Now I don't know if insurance providers will be willing to insure a <laughs> constellation that flies on one rocket because um, if that rocket goes, whoops, there goes the constellation um, with it as well. But I just want to point something out that kind of goes back to uh, the James Webb story earlier which is that the reason James Webb is flying on an Ariane 5 is because that payload fairing is the largest out there. So that means that that's, yeah. we're, we're at the limit of what space telescopes can do right now, simply because we can't really fit anything else mm. inside of something, because there's nothing bigger at the moment. If sure. you build something bigger, like BFR, uh, holy smokes, like, mm -hmm. Why do we even have to have it folding? We could just have a massive monolithic telescope um, with it there. Have the mirror be uh, be segmented, but a monolithic design, so we don't have to fold it up and then and then go. Oh my God, will it unfold correctly? Um, so that way we can we maybe have a little bit easier, a little cheaper of a design with it there as well. And also, you know, a lot no, of no, no, they'll just build a bigger folding mirror. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's what they'll do. That's what the JWST scientists will do. They'll be like, well, instead of doing the cheaper, easier thing, can we just do bigger and more complicated? So uh, so why even have it folding when we can literally just uh, launch uh, like 10 really big parts on 10 really big BFRs? Um, so see what you've done? Look what you're making me do. Um, so uh, we'll just build it in space. Um, that'll work. We'll t and then we'll do the collimation in space too. That's nice and easy. We'll just fly up the, the lab technicians and do it that way. Um, but also, you know, everybody laughed about the BFR spacecraft at the International Space Station. No, oh, look at how big it is. Um, but BFR spaceship is really just a little bit bigger than shuttle, if you think about it. 
So, I mean, it could carry a lot more people in cargo uh, than <laughs> shuttle can. Yeah. Um, but, but operationally, you know, it's something that actually could, uh, could do it. And I think uh, uh, it'd be hilarious to see it do an orbital boost for the International Space Station and see how high we could get it. So, yeah. Let's do it. Well, we one, one well that kind of brings me back to a point earlier about how, um, you know, there have been studies by Lockheed Martin and Boeing to disconnect pieces of the International Space Station whenever the retirement happens. And those were their first concepts of what would be the, the, the Deep Space Gateway, their, their lunar gateway concepts that they were calling it back then. Um, and I would still like to see something like that. I would like us to boost the International Space Station or move it to a different orbit. You know, I've talked about that lots of times. So that would be really cool to see. I would love to see something like that. One of the comparisons I think of the of the International Space Station, its internal volume, if I'm not cur if I'm not mistaken, is somewhere around the same internal volume as a 747. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, that's about right. And if BFR's uh, internal volume is about that of an A380, if if I recall hearing that correctly, um, basically pulling a BFR up to the to the International Space Station is like doubling the the internal volume of it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, who says that you can't put a laboratory inside of the BFR and do some work in there? So that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, we've got a couple more comments that we're going to get to in After Dark. Uh, so uh, stick around for that if you're watching live, or it'll be available on demand uh, after the fact uh, in a few weeks, unless you're a patron. And speaking of patrons, people who are going to get access to After Dark right away, I'd like to thank our ground support crew for uh, also contributing to the show. These are people who have contributed between $1 and $2.49 to the show. Uh, once again, every single dollar helps. And to find out how you can help crowdfund show the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. As I mentioned at the beginning uh, of the last segment, uh, next week we've got the Modular Analog Research Station, or MARS. Uh, that's going to be on orbit 10.38, and it is, uh, it's in mission, I believe, right now. And I think it just started or is just about to start. Uh, and that basically means that they're simulating a Mars outpost so any questions you want to ask live during the show are going to take, and I don't know. Ask them now. Ask them now. That's exactly correct. Ask them <laughs> in the chat room. Ask them on Twitter. Uh, do hashtag, uh, I don't care. <laughs> I should have thought of that in advance. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag Mars. I was going to say hashtag Mars, but hashtag Mars or something like that. We'll, just at tomorrow, we'll find them on Twitter. Same thing with Facebook. Certainly ask them now because we need to get them in advance. So um, anything that we do live with their ground crew, we would be able to do in real time. But anything that we're doing with their simulated Mars stuff, it's just as pretend like they're on Mars. So we need to wait for the full speed of light round trip to occur, which depending upon the orientation of the planets is anywhere between, um, actually I think it's like between six minutes and 22 minutes. I don't remember the range, but it's something like Sounds that. Sounds about right. And I'm not sure what they're simulating, like wh where the planets are in alignment, so I don't know where they're at in their simulation. But it is definitely more than six minutes uh, one direction, so it'd be 12 minutes round trip, but I think mm -hmm. we're at like nine. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. Questions in advance. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be- It's going to be interesting for it sure. Will be, it will definitely be mm -hmm. interesting. It's going to be, I think it's going to be the first, I don't know if anyone else has tried to do like a live show on a simulated Mars environment before. So this is going to be, I think, a lot of fun. I don't know if it will be successful or miserable failure. Um, oh, oh, that's really great. Uh, DanTC24, Ask Mars. That's the hashtag right there. Hashtag Ask, ask, hashtag Mars. ask Mars. I love that. This is why we have a live community. Thank you for that, Data. Mm -hmm. All right, that is our show for this week. Thank you all so much for watching. We'll see you next week after Dark Up Next.